Welcome to FutureX, the podcast where we look to solve the variable that is the future of Web3. Every week, we'll talk with some of the brightest minds in the blockchain and Web3 space, from top investors to founders and builders, paving the way for a decentralized world. So what is the future of blockchain? What will Web3 look like in 2050? Let's explore together. Hello. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, Good morning. Um, Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to FutureX, the podcast uh, that we gather uh, a lot of insights and uh, top talents, uh, top minds in the crypto industry. Um, Today is the 18th episode. Um, This is your host, uh, Matt Liu from SimFutures. We are very happy uh, to have Colin Hong from uh, Standard Crypto to join us today. Um, So without uh, further ado, I'll pass this to Colin. Colin, maybe can you uh, give us a very quick intro about yourself and your journey into crypto? Yeah, happy to. And uh, thanks for having me on. You know, I'm, re- I'm really excited to be here. Um, quick background. Uh, I'm an investor at Standard Crypto. Um, we're one of the larger crypto native uh, VCs. Our two founders come over from uh, Lightspeed and Benchmark. They were running the crypto verticals there, but didn't really see what they're looking for in the crypto native space, which is sort of a proper blend of Web2 company building and crypto nativity. Um, yeah, we think we bring a pretty unique blend of uh, company building and uh, deep, deep crypto nativity um, um, to the space. Uh, so that's what, that's my, that's my day job. And then sort of my, my side job is just, um, trying to touch absolutely everything new that comes out in crypto. And then that's what I've been doing for the last, you know, seven, six years, um, in the space. I, I first, uh, I took a circuitous, uh, journey here, but, um, I first got my touch. I was a student at MIT, um, I, back in 2014, I was a junior, I had just switched into computer science, um, and Jeremy Rubin was actually uh, kind enough to to give every single uh, undergrad a third of a Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin was about $300 wow. at, at the time, um, so it was a $100 donation. It was called the Grand Bitcoin Experiment. It was just this um, great um, experiment, sort of externalities, give a bunch of people this like cool, interesting tech and see what they build with it. You know, if you can inspire five or 10 kids to get interested in it, you know, you've succeeded. Um, and for a while we thought, we thought he had with Sam, um, um, that turned out to be, you know, uh, misguided, but, um, overall, I think it was a really interesting experiment. Um, the, the, the New Yorker actually wrote a piece on it. Um, there was one sushi restaurant about a block North of campus. That was the only place in, in the vicinity that took crypto. Um, and we used to mm. take turns sort of like, it, uh, uh, you could almost think of it as a hundred dollar gift card for the people that weren't willing to go too much deeper. Um, I, I was fairly fortunate. So I actually spent that Bitcoin on League of Legends skins. I had some very expensive, you know, some gaming skins. Um, but I was fortunate <laughs> enough to be, <laughs> um, I was, I was fortunate enough to be taking a class at the same time taught by Ron Rivest of the RSA algorithm. It was called cryptography and web security. Um, and at the time we were doing like these, like, it's kind of ironic when you think about it, but we were hosting blockchains on AWS. We were like mining them and then we were mm. attacking other uh, uh, other groups' chains. Um, and so the, the confluence of those two things at the same time um, was really helpful for me. And, and wow. that got me. That got me into it. Um, I, I went into TradFi. Um, I was I was doing quantitative trading for 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 um, a number of years, uh, and then that certainly influenced a lot of my thinking about DeFi, about markets. Um, you know, reading the Bancor white paper in 2017 as a market maker, and you're looking at this thing, and you're like, impermanent loss hadn't been invented yet. Um, we just had short gamma, and we're just looking at this thing, and like, you know, what 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 is this construct? Um, but it but it was very informative. Um, mm-hmm. and then uh, maybe about a year and a half ago. Um, I was I was working at a large asset manager. I was I was at Millennium at the time, um, doing quant trading, um, and getting frustrated by certain crypto trades that I couldn't put on. Um, we were mm. we, you know we 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 were in a fair we were in a fairly advantageous position. Um, there was a lot of stuff that we couldn't do, um, and so I started looking to make the move into space to go full time. Um, and so uh, you know, picture this. It's sort of like early 22. Um, the markets are pretty frothy. Um, and so uh, if you're sitting in the position of like uh, TradFi looking to make the move into crypto, um, you had a couple of different verticals you could have moved into. Um, I could have tried to start a protocol. Uh, I could have joined a prop trading firm. I could have like a quant trading firm or or I could have gone VC. Um, and this was something that I had done at the very start of my career when I went into Trad. 
uh, when I went into TradFi. Um, I think I think the best seat in the market into a period of you know maybe contraction um, mm-hmm. is is sitting at sort of a deep thesis VC. Um, I, I really strongly believe that. I think um, being a founder into the bear is it's obviously the best time to build. Um, I have a mm-hmm. ton of respect for all the founders that build, um, but it can be discouraging. Uh, you know, I think I think one thing that I really key on there is um, not knowing whether uh, what you're building has product market fit because people aren't using it or because people aren't there to use it. Um, and that's sort of like a, that that you don't know if you don't know. I went through that a lot in the quant world. Um, I think that those are very hard problems. Um, and same thing with prop trading. Um, you know, liquidity dries up, spreads blow mm-hmm. out. Um, it's it's less profitable in a bear market, whereas um, you know, being a capital allocator seems like a very advantageous position. Um, and specifically being um, a really strong deep thesis VC, where um, you're really backing sort of like exceptional founders rather than you know just going for like market beta. Um, that 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 was important to me. Awesome. So you mentioned you're from MIT. Did 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 you take the Gary Gensler course there? That famous I did not, one that everyone watched. <laughs> I did not actually. So I started um, because you did. You, you didn't like him at the time. <laughs> yeah, I already knew he didn't smell right. <laughs> um, um, no, uh, uh, I started uh, business and, and um, math because I thought that was the. I, I I've always sort of been interested in trading. Um, from very mm-hmm. from a very young age, I actually got into. Um, I think a lot of uh, uh, crypto people have similar origin stories where we played either RuneScape or in, in my case, it was Team Fortress mm. 2, just um, an early game with digital items that had value. Um, and so from those points, you, you're like, oh, wait, I like trading these items more than I like playing the game. Maybe there's something there. You're like, okay, maybe I like markets. Um, so I, when I went into college, I was looking at like math and uh, uh, finance. So I missed, I missed Gary. I think he was on the economic side. <laughs> um, yeah yeah it's the mit media lab or uh, something yeah. that, that you know he he, he gives the, that lecture yeah um wow wow um maybe you pass it you pass by you know him in, on campus maybe you know yeah gave, you guys gave, said gave hi but you, you, you didn't know who oh, oh yeah <laughs> that's a good one um yeah so so colin then um you you, you joined standard crypto which is a it's a, it's a very successful VC fund in this industry, yeah. And as you mentioned, you guys have a very deep thesis and a large portfolio, right? So can you help us like describe the investment thesis of standard crypto? In, in, in short, I, I know you can talk hours, but, you know, the, the if summary I, if, points. If I had to really condense it in, into one word, I, and I have already mentioned this, I think it's it's founder quality. It's like it's like exceptional founders. Founder um, and this was a transition for me coming over from, you know, quant finance. Um, in in, in TradFi, mm. there's this concept of beta, right? Where it's like, if you can't yes. get the best thing, or if the best thing has certain shapes that don't make it like attractive to invest, um, you get beta, you get, you know, the second best mm. thing is fine. You know, you model it, maybe, maybe you get more of it, maybe you get less of it depending on it, on it, on its um, composition. But um, there are ways to sort of like recreate the best thing with the second best thing in, in, in quantitative finance. Um, and what I've learned in, in, in VC over, over the last year and a half is that doesn't exist. Um, you can't mm. sort of like, like liking a certain market and liking the tailwinds of a market and liking whether it's, you know, excitement or a narrative or, or early traction, um, you need the right founder themselves because even you know you know um even timeline can be can be ephemeral like you know one one thing can start working um and then a great founder can step in and sort of you know seize the market um and if you're trading that's one dynamic and if you're long-term investing that's a very different dynamic and so um i think that's been my biggest learning and i would say if i had to sort of summarize our thesis it's you know i i haven't seen in the year and a half that i've been here i have not seen us write a check that we didn't like fully fully believe in the founder I see. So can I interpret that in trading terms as finding alpha in founders? Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Fundamental analysis. This is trading <laughs> fundamental analysis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, I was a trader before, so uh, I, I quite understand w- what you're talking about. Yeah. Rather than just taking a market beta, now let's find you know alpha in people in what they can do as breakthrough. Because after all, this industry, well, 
well, I think this industry is never short of like uh, mediocre teams who can fork someone else and then, you know, start to do something, launch a token. But this industry is short of uh, like truly entrepreneurial founders that build their own thing for the long run. And of course, you know, uh, backed by uh, top VCs uh, like yeah. Standard Crypto. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, um, like, like, like the other entrepreneur in this call. I agree. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, so um, we, we can also talk a little bit about um, the derivative market, which I know you're, you're an expert in, right? So um, recently, I, you know, we, we have seen, you know, different models in terms of the perp stacks, um, as well as options, um, you know, getting like increasing volume um, this year versus last year. Um, do you see some of these trends going to, you know, make, you know, make change to the overall landscape of the DeFi derivatives market? Um, yeah, what, what, what's your view in this? You know, which one you think may prevail, which model? Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because I also think that the answer sort of has changed with time. Um, I'll just sort of like come out and say some high level beliefs um, and, then, and then we can sort of backtrack um, from there. Um, one is basically that retail in TradFi uses options as Delta leverage. Um, and so, so when you mm. look at like the retail complex, I, I and I, I somewhat speak from a position of authority here, being um, I, I, you know, the first four years of my career was an options market maker, um, where we mostly faced retail, um, and so those were kind of also like that was 2015 to 2019, which was golden years of Wall Street bets. It was before the like. GameStop stuff had all happened uh, and they were all like, you know, stock short squeezer before it used to be a bunch of option traders. Um, and they were all, you know, I was on it too. Uh, we were all, we were all not, we were all not very smart, um, but we used to look, pull it up and look at like the, the, the trades. Um, and the way that people do this is it's very short dated. It's out of the money calls, it's puts, it's Delta leverage, right? It's like, Mm. Um, because one interesting thing is, um, the concept of a perp position that we have in crypto is actually a crypto native invention. We like that doesn't really exist in TradFi. The concept of this isolated margin position that sort of just like like uh, isolated explodes when it when it liquidates. Um, in TradFi, you get a margin call, right? Like you put yeah. a margin trade on on Tesla and it goes minus ninety percent. You're that's not an isolated position. That that's not closed. You get a call from Robinhood saying, "Hey, you owe us a bunch of money." Um, and so if you want that vehicle, like that's like, Hey, I'm putting up a small amount of premium, like, like a perp, tra a perp trade is I'm putting up some small amount of notional. I want some amount of leverage. If you want that isolated, if I want that construct in TradFi, it's actually an options trade. Uh, you put up a small amount of notional. You can almost think of like the premium as like some, like, like uh notional that you're putting mm. up. And then, you know, it, the, the concept of the liquidation doesn't exist. It's just like a time-based liquidation, but it's, it, it's not the same, but but for the purposes of retail where they just want like really, really leveraged exposure to, to a movement, um, it works the same for them. Um, and it's obviously worse, I think. Um, there are certain characteristics that don't make it as good in terms of, I think implied vol is very confusing. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's naturally, this was something that, you know, I was a market maker. I think they're naturally um, liquidity disadvantages to an option structure versus a perp structure in terms of um, naturally having a sort of like fractionalized liquidity across strikes, yep. across uh, expirations specifically. Um, if you just think about how a perp works, it's just all fungible. It's one instrument. Yeah, right? it's one uh, dimension. Yeah, like it's one dimension. dimension. Exactly. Um, and I think funding rate is much more uh, understandable than than implied vol. If you're just like, oh, this is a funding rate. I'm going to pay this every eight hours or whatever versus like implied vol. Okay. And then, you know, you have like, like us market makers know to divide by 16, but like th that's a esoteric thing in of itself. Um, and, and non market makers aren't even going to know what I'm talking about. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, there, I think perps, if you just want Delta leverage are a better instrument. Um, mm -hmm. Now, with that said, uh, and, and so I think that there have been interesting times where like, you know, um, I think I think in early 22, when the first perp dex mechanism started working, like GMX started working, um, you had this dynamic where people were like, oh, like, look at all this TradFi options volume. This is coming to crypto. Like, it's going to be great. Um, and I think what was missing was, well, all of that demand is already kind of satiated by perps. For all the delta leverage demand is satiated by perps. And the actual time dimension demand of options, which is important, like whether you're hedging events um, or stuff, 
uh, it basically it's like taking opinions on events, really using the maturations of them, um, isn't as big of a thing in crypto. You know, we don't have as sophisticated um, speculators. But one thing that I do think is going in options favor, and I think you can sort of tell this by some of the advancements in recent options protocols and, and sort of like TVL and Notional Traded on, on DeFi, mm -hmm. um, is there's been a bit of a changing of a guard. Where if you think about a lot of the uh, sort of old crypto mark crypto native market makers that maybe use perps to hedge have either um, you know been 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 running Ponzi's or uh, uh, sort of have have fallen out of the space um, or 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 are still alive. But the point is that there are more uh, institutional traditional uh, institutions coming in. You know, Citadel is coming in. Um, I mm. talked with Susquehanna. Susquehanna option market makers are coming in. Um, and so these are players that are very sophisticated and are very um, sort of used to using options to hedge positions or to put on views. Um, and I, so I think as those maybe make up more of sort of like, the, I, I think retail will mm -hmm. always use perps and maybe start using options more. I think the institutional set is is changing guards a little bit to a more options friendly. Um, so I do think that, I think that there are a lot of tailwinds in the options market. But I think that I it, in in its truest form of delta leverage, it's going up against perps. Yeah, I would say in crypto, like like you said, taking a leverage with perp is a easy um, and you know pretty transparent thing with uh, good liquidity concentrated. Right. Mm -hmm. Once you collapse the three dimension thing into one dimension, uh, the liquidity you know is much better. Yeah. Why why not? It's as simple as trading a spot, honestly speaking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, because you know, in our earlier version, in our first version, when we built Sim Futures, we had uh, futures with maturities, and we just realized that uh, fragmented um, liquidity issue by maturity that hasn't yet added added that dimension of mature like uh, strike price, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, we, then then we thought, okay, yeah, let's just make things simple, and then eventually, um, you know. Well, people used to think, look, uh, perp is a derivative. But if you look at the broader sense, I, I'm coming from a TradFi background, right? You're looking at a broader definition of what is a derivative. Even uh, the spot, right, are a piece of code, right? A couple of lines of code. Are they like anything physical? Yeah, yeah. No, they're not, right? So by a TradFi definition, you buy Bitcoin, that's a derivative. You buy a Ethereum, it's a derivative. You buy a Bitcoin perp, it's a derivative. You buy a Ethereum perp, it's a derivative. So that that is that line is pretty blurry, and so that that's why it's so easy for retailers, I think, to to understand and use it. Um, yeah, it's um it's such a retail friendly uh, like experience. But of course, on, on the other side, I, I think you make a good point. The institutions, yeah, with their, I mean with where they they came from right so so they're they're more prone to use uh options um but you know we'll uh, hopefully yeah hopefully you know the, the this whole market can grow larger with bigger liquidity so that even the even in a three-dimensional world there can be a sufficient liquidity in you know in, in every little cube there <laughs> um yeah and so, sorry. Moving to the next uh, next uh, topic, um, Collins. I, I think you you you've been doing pretty well, right? Since moving from TradFi into now, um, you know, crypto um, investment. Uh, for someone, for example, looking to break into crypto um, from that tra TradFi world, what would be your suggestions to to them? Of course, Ooh. you know you're gonna recommend them to join Standard Crypto if they can. You know it's yep. a it's a fund with strong thesis, uh, but not everyone can. So, you know. <laughs> so perspective of somebody that's like interested in crypto and is coming in, and I'm just sort of like giving them general advice on how to how to like yes, navigate. Sir. Um, I think the most important thing is the ability to go deep on sort of like a whim. I think um getting. The ability to get distracted and go deep on certain topics is the most consistent indicator of whether or not somebody will sort of succeed in this space, I think. And that's because um, you sort of have to just get interested in the new thing, um, whether it's mm. whether the new thing is going to be the big thing or not the big thing. Um, you don't know. And that's kind of the, the important thing. Um, everybody's like, oh, you know. 
if I was just there when when certain thing happened, I would have recognized it. You don't really recognize it when it's happening. You just have to be playing it. Um, and so uh, I think my first recommendation would be try everything. Um, you know, anything new that comes out, be one of the first people to onboard it. Try it out. Um, the worst thing you're going to do is earn like a dust of an implicit airdrop. The best thing you're going to do is find a new narrative early. Um, mm. And so it's that it's the curiosity to try everything new. And then it's really it's really the ability to go deep on on new things, um, whether you're, you know, scripting with it, whether you're writing tooling for it, whether what wh whatever you're doing, um, um, you know, getting above the level of like, oh, I think this is good. Let me buy it. Um, it, it is sort of like an important, <laughs> important step. I'm serious. Um, and that's, that's sort of like what, what I look at when I'm, look, when I'm, when I'm talking to people, um, and, and we're sort of, um, yeah, we're sharing ideas. I, I've found that that to be somebody that gets interested in random stuff and it can go deep on that, um, is, is the most consistent mm. indicator of, of success in this space. I see. Have curiosity and then go deep. Yeah. Yeah, you have yeah. to follow follow your curiosity. Basically, that's how you find new stuff. Um, so, so Colin, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it's the winter market now, right? And um, you invested in a lot of projects, a um, lot of uh, good teams, and then some of these teams are, you know, keep they keep they, they keep building in the winter, and then you know they're doing something right, and then some other teams maybe they need some improvement. So, in terms of um, like advice you could give to them, you know, how to you know, do, do the right things in the winter. Um, anything you could share? I think, I, I, I think there's two things to pick up on here. Mm -hmm. One is sort of going back to that first point. I think it's in the winter, the most discouraging thing as a founder is you don't know if what you're building is good and there's just nobody there for it or whether what you're building isn't good and the people that are there just don't want that um i think that that like you don't know if you don't i, I went through that a lot in tradfire you're looking for a signal in a data set you don't know if it exists or you just can't find it like very <laughs> you don't know you don't know very very difficult yeah. problems um and so um i think i think that that is something that is it going to be a difficult challenge for a founder to get through during this thing and i think specifically when you're trying to attract new users during this time um i think i think the thing that most people are used to using to incentivize users is token emissions um and i think in a bull market that works really well you know people are excited to have equity in these things they're excited to believe in the vision um they're you know they're they'll, they will hold it they're not going to instantly sell it um and so you don't sort of um pay the effective dilution as as painfully in, in a bull market mm. I think in a bear market, when when conditions are tighter, um, that effective dilution is much more expensive. Um, and I don't actually think that you're necessarily growing market share. You maybe are just you might be cementing market share with the existing um, um, natives that are sort of like left. Um, but if your model, you know, a new if you model new excitement, new participants. Um, it, it can be obviously be a, an advantage of strength to to have like a native buy-in going into a, a next wave, but if you also think about it, you're sort of just paying retention for people that already know about it are probably already using it. Um, it for for some period of time, you're just sort of uh, 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 paying very very expensive customer acquisition costs without actually necessarily getting any new um, users. I mean, so I think that that's the most important thing to think about when going into a bear, is um, how mm -hmm. are you using your emissions. Um, how are you using your incentivization? I think it gets very, very expensive um, in bears to to use these things. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's the main that's the main thing that I think about. Thanks. I I, I like this. You don't know what you don't know part. Um, I mean, I had the same experience when you know, we were launching new products, but first we don't know whether there's a, you know a, a good amount of users that will come after we launch. And then, or, you know, there's something wrong we need to improve on the product side. Although we always think we build the best product uh, for the most people, but eventually um, the market results are the only source of truth, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually that will, will, will guide us. But in a bear market, sometimes 
um, it's it's either their limited feedback or um, like like you said, um, I, I, I will say like like a low ROI um, in terms of making marketing and user acquisition um, type of expenses. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but the, the the best part is, uh, um, you know, I think you know, we, we have patience. Yeah, and uh, also you know the even better part is uh, uh, the summer is going to come. Yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Colin, I also want to uh, pick your mind on your view on different sectors in crypto, right? So, you know, how how do you see them? Which you think would uh, be, I would say, be booming in, in the next bull run, uh, or which would just um, kind of fizzle out eventually? Uh, for example, um, you know, we, we had NFTs before and then, you know, DeFi and um, now a lot of like social tokens, you know, front tech is a new thing. Um, and, and there are all these like new models that coming up. Um, yep. What's your view? Which, which is going to win? Which uh, may, you know. Yeah, may, may I, think, I think that's a, a great question. Um, I sort of have two things in my head as really important innovations over, say, the last year, year and a half of this bear. Um, and I think one of them is going to be very obvious to a lot of people. I think one of them may not. I think uh, I'll start with the obvious one. Um, I think um, uh, mobile mobile stack. I'm very excited about. Um, obviously, off of the back of Frentech, um, and and really why I'm so excited about it is it's the first time I'm using my phone for crypto, in really six years of of I'm I'm you know you can look at my on chain history. Uh, uh, I think. If you put, sort of sampled a hundred random people from the street, I would probably be the number one like like number of transactions. I think if you went to like you know people that have used crypto, I would still be in the a, a, a high percentage. Um, so wow. I, I I've been a I've been a kind of a uh, oh, it's not necessarily great transactions. There's just a lot of them. Um, <laughs> but I, but I do a lot of transactions, and it's always been um, extension based. I've always been browser. You know, I sit at a computer or whether it's a laptop. Um, and I interact through MetaMask, or you know, sometimes I go to Rabi and uh, other 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 extension-based browsers. But I've never used MetaMask Mobile really. I remember in 2021, I would go to conferences and I would talk to NFT traders who would be doing everything on their mobile. And I'm like, what? That was such a different paradigm from how I use crypto with zero assets on my mobile and everything on sort of a ledger. What what Frentech got started doing was getting me to be using crypto every single day on my mobile. Um, I think, you know, before then I'd used twice in my life. One time, like I was skiing and I wanted to do some Ponzi while I was skiing. And, and another time there was, there was a city bike, um, thing that happened recently. You go around scanning city bikes, uh, that pleaser put out. Um, and, and so we, we did that. It, you needed your phone, scan the QR code, but two times in six years I had that I'd ever used phone. And then all of a sudden <laughs> I'm using it every single day. Um, and so that was a really big shift for me um, in terms of how I'm interacting with crypto on my phone. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think really getting around um, uh, uh, sort of the, the uh, existing browser wallet experience is really powerful. I think it's a really painful install process. In, you're mm. trying to show a friend a new app. Hey, here's this cool new crypto thing. Like you want to, you want to try this out? Okay. Uh, uh, download the wallet. Okay. Uh, I'll write down your 20 word <laughs> seed phrase on a napkin. Okay. Re-enter it in the correct order. Okay. Now, now that you're in it, it's like six button presses away from getting to the web app to go to the browser page, right? Like it's, um, it's a very painful process getting to like a destination through that. Um, and so yeah. I think what Frentech showed the world was, okay, just sideload it with an embedded wallet. And, you know, you move the friction a little bit from, um, installing to funding, because because maybe there's an assumption mm. that like if you're starting with a mobile wallet, you probably already have funds on it and you can interact with stuff. And here you have to start fresh and get funds there. So I think you move the, yeah. but I, I think that's a much less friction than the installing. And I think we've seen that um, through their sort of like uh, 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 user adoption. And so um, that's something that I'm really excited about. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it front tech is exciting, but I'm more excited about the entire like mobile diaspora that's going to like emerge over the next six, eight months. I'm talking with all of these really like um, smart and talented builders that are building idler games and uh, uh, different variants of board games. Um, different. So I, I think obviously social uh, uh, stuff is, is obvious, but um, uh, yeah, just different types of games. I think I think over the next six to 12 months, we're going to get just a ton of like experimental iteration. 
um, in that, and I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, and then the other one that I, th so I think that one's pretty obvious. I think a lot of people are kind of excited about mobile stuff. Um, I think the one that is less obvious that I do think is a really, uh, I don't think it, was, it wasn't invented in this bear, but I think it was popularized in this bear, is um, retail RFQ trading, RFQ style trading. Um, and so I think uh, just maybe based on the the infrastructure and the and the design of some of the perpetual deck systems, but the sort of like RFQ, I want to like market buy something slider 50x long, like go. Um, I think mm. that interface versus a uh, limit order interface is actually sort of like one of the bigger innovations of this bear, or at least the way that the market has adopted that sort of trading style. Um, we sort of go back to like user user friend like user friendliness, um, whether it's like Robinhood not showing people options implied vol, but I also think there's another level of friendliness where you're like, you know, a limit order book is intimidating, and you as a user yes. have to determine, okay, what's my like what's my uh, time latency price sensitivity, right? Like that's like that's a as a trader you're like okay like you know I can TWAP, I can just market bid like I can use the tool of a limit order book to, to help with my execution. But I think to, to um, a less sophisticated, it, it's just, it's more intimidating and it's just like, they just want to buy, right? Like they don't want to um, right. deal. With, oh, and, and I think getting in is one thing um, as somebody who has traded a bunch using limit order books and using RFQ based systems. I think the actual, it's, it's t super intangible and this is all feel, but it's actually getting out that is what feels better for an RFQ system than a limit order book. Because if you imagine getting out of a losing trade on a limit order book, it feels very bad. You're chasing these limits downwards and you're just not getting filled and you're just like mm. showing your position to the market. Um, at least that's how I feel <laughs> when I'm losing a trade. Um, in an RFQ, it's just close, right? Like you don't have to sit there dealing with like putting in these yeah. limit orders and, and chasing it down um, close. Um, and so I think, I think that that, framing of the trading to retail is actually a, a big sort of phase shift from presenting them with these intimidating coinbase pro or or whatever like like trading interfaces and now it's just you know buy sell uh, it's a uniswap interface but but for uh more sophisticated trading um so i think that i think that those that that is actually a big motion yeah i mean overall better user experience right so yeah. because Whatever we have been used to, like in the past, like like I said, sitting in front of a computer, doing things in the browser, and uh, you know that that, that experience, um, maybe a couple of years later, would no longer exist. You know, we'll just do everything on mobile. Yeah. Um, and hopefully that day will come very soon. Actually, uh, if we look forward uh, even further, um, assuming this is twenty fifty, yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll be around. Yeah, we, we will. Yes. Um, and uh, crypto has gone mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as expected. Uh, I, I think maybe even earlier than that. But let, let's say 2050. Um, what do you think the experience um, would, 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 would be like? Um, not only just user experience of a, like, like a D app, but generally speaking, crypto and our daily life. Ooh. Um... So sometimes I like to tell friends, it's like, I, like, I believe the, like, I think it's really hard to refute it, 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 if you're already sort of bought into this extent, it's like, mm. I believe programmable money is the future. Like just the concept that we have these programmable bits of money, you can send, they can be conditional, you know, you can have requirements, you can um, purely self custody, like, like programmable bits of money to me is the future. Um, and sort of like everything else, like I'm just here to like, you know, you know, those like, or memes like miss or enjoy or like, I'm just here to enjoy or the ride. It's just like, I'm just here to um, have a good time. Like while we usher in this new future that I sort of see as inevitable. Um, assuming 50 years down the line, you know, we, we, we haven't, you know, the, the humanity still exists and we're now using crypto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two two big assumptions. Um, the uh, uh, I joke, I joke. Um, I think the main thing that I index on is permissionless composability. I think that's what I get most excited about with crypto. Mm. I think the other obvious answer would have been self custody. Um, that we all, you know, in in the future, we all own our own assets. Um, in, in a more uh, uh, efficient and, and secure and real way um, than, than we do today. Uh, 
but I don't know if that's entirely true because I look at a lot of dynamics um, in crypto and I think that they're more power dynamics than necessarily custody dynamics. Like for example, a game designer could give you an NFT um, and then ban that I item in the game or change the item <laughs> in the game, right? You own the NFT. You, you own it. Yeah, you own it. Of NFT, mm. um, but the, the, I, the, the shape of the actual I thing is changing. Um, because there's this power imbalance where they have centralized power. Now, if it's a decentralized system, then that's different. But like in the concept of like a centralized game developer giving you an NFT, it, you don't actually really have custody of that because you have a representation, you have a token representation of it, but um, you don't necessarily, unless maybe, maybe there's some trait thing that maybe they can't change it. But if they can change it, my point is um, you don't actually have proper custody. And that sort of dynamic exists everywhere, whether it's people giving you non-transferable tokens, um, th that's common, mm. um, whether it's uh, uh, stuff for like, um, you actually have to restake it to put it in to get rewards, that's kind of common. Um, so, so I would say self-custody is important but we often that I think that that surface has a lot of flexibility um, in terms of how uh, uh, whether you're truly self-custodial or or whether it actually looks more like partial. Um, I think what I get really excited about is permissionless composability. It's just this concept of everything that you build has always on outward-facing APIs, um, and so then anyone can just sort of build stuff and interact with that. Um, and by outward facing APIs, I just mean the smart contract, right? But it's like, um, you know, uh, uh, people can build, uh, I, I actually think something like um, Sin Futures is a great example where you can have um, isolated liquidity on a protocol layer, and then anybody else in the world can come in and build depositing vaults that will sit on top of it, right? And will yes. like like allocate um, a bunch of capital and to different, yeah, yeah, based on a strategy or based on a ratio or or however sort of they determine that. But anybody can do that, and it's totally permissionless and it's composable, right? Um, and you know they don't have to. If it was a tradfi thing, you know they have to. That's a business relationship, and they're calling you up, and you know you're <laughs> banking partners, and you've got a uh, service agreement. Um, and, yeah, all this middleman that's going to take a fee, yeah? Um, yeah, and that stops innovation because if you want to start a new thing in TradFi, you're like, hey, like imagine you had like a liquidity aggregator for something in TradFi. You're like, hey, I want to get started. What do you what do? You do You call up the bank. You're like, hey, I have this idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what's, what's the even motion to building that? It's like, okay, you're going to go go raise money. Go raise, you know, it, you're doing a... a fintech thing good luck go raise 20 million from from whoever and then that's the, how you have to get that started whereas here it's you know um if you're in your basement with a good idea and you write the code mm. and it works you know it's deployed and and that's the production system and it's meritocratic um i, I think that that permissionless composability um is kind of just like a phase shift in it and in, in sort of what i get what, what i'm always here for is experimental iteration you know we're not necessarily we're not necessarily going to build the uh, uh, greatest like you know version of it out of the gate, but we are going to like experiment and iterate and find find uh, uh, the right sort of like product features off of that. Nice permissionless composability. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that's the future. Completely agree. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Colin. Um, I think today we had a very good chat with you, and then. Thanks for all the insights you share with the audience. Um, yeah, with, with that, you know, thank you again. Um, and then we will have more questions maybe coming from the audience. Um, and then we can address that to you so you can help uh, answer them a bit later. Thank you yeah. very much. Happy to. Great talking. Thanks for listening to the FutureX podcast. Subscribe on Spotify or wherever you're listening to this episode. 